Welcome to the Sales Lead Dog Podcast, hosted by CRM technology and sales process expert, Christopher Smith, talking with sales leaders that have separated themselves from the rest of the pack. Listen to find out how the best of the best achieve success with their team and CRM technology. And remember, unless you are the lead dog, the view never changes. Welcome to Sales Lead Dog. Today we have joining us Jamie Shanks, CEO of Pipeline Signals. Jamie, welcome to Sales Lead Dog. Thank you so much for having me. Great to have you here, Jamie. Jamie, um, for those of you who may not be familiar with Jamie, Jamie is deeply, deeply experienced and passionate when it comes to social selling, digital selling. Tell us a bit about your journey and, and, and how you got to Pipeline Signals. Um, I invented the word social selling and pioneered the category and essentially the way it all began was I was a vice president of sales at a SaaS software company in Toronto, Canada. You'll hear my Canuck accent here along the journey. And at the ripe age of 30, I thought I knew everything there was to know about sales and I decided I was going to quit my job and start a sales consultancy, which over the next two years failed miserably. And in the pain of trying to build pipeline for myself, I ultimately had to self discover a new way. I was great at writing emails, I was great at making cold calls, but that wasn't scalable enough to generate the type of pipeline I needed for myself, let alone help my customers. And for whatever reason, night after night, I would stare at my laptop, and I would look at this newly minted tool called LinkedIn. And you know, it was used to put your online resume out there. And I would look at it and think, how do I reverse engineer this tool to become net beneficial for business development? And I would, I would see these back doors and hacks and tips. I would document them, test them out. And then the next days I would show a customer of mine, hey, look what I discovered. And they were way more interested in what I was showing them there. And a light bulb went off and I said, oh my God, there's a training business here. So for 10 years, I got really fortunate that I jumped the shark and we went from local Toronto businesses to winning Oracle 23,000 sellers on a five year engagement in one year. And so I jumped to the global enterprise and the global mid market by half a stance and kind of stayed there. So we served the global enterprise, global mid market, 600 global customers, quarter million customer or sellers certified. And then along that journey, sellers would ask me, you're teaching me to mine intelligence, sales intelligence out of LinkedIn why don't you just do this for me? Or why don't you just do it for the whole company? And for years, I would say, now I'm in sales enablement, I'm here to transfer knowledge. And then ultimately, in 2020, when COVID hit, I wasn't on 80 airplanes anymore every year, I bought back a lot of my time, and it gave me an opportunity to ask myself, what if, what if I actually did build that managed service? So in 2021, we incorporated the business. And now we have pipeline signals, which our customers give us their customers and their prospects and their ideal customer profile. And we're monitoring it for people leaving their customers and going into prospects, people taking new jobs and being promoted, competitive intelligence. And we're routing that sales intelligence into their CRM as task notifications for the sellers. So the sellers have just bought back a mountain of time and now they have the answers to the test. They see at a revenue operations level, every sales opportunity, every sales risk based on human capital inside their CRM. And see that you guys are solving a huge problem for because nobody has the time to sit there and go into LinkedIn and do all this stuff manually. It's a giant time suck. And but you need to do it as part of your job. Like you, and it's not something you just do every once in a while. You have to do it all the time to really be effective. Yeah, the customers can, must love you. I, I want, I'll paint the picture at a at kind of a a revenue operations level. So there's a couple major pain points. You pay your sellers for outcomes. We'll call them $500 an hour value creators. Yet 11% study done by Gardner, 11% of a seller's week is spent doing $5 an hour tasks, which is looking for intelligence on Google and LinkedIn and Twitter to be able to do the most important parts of business development, account selection, and account prioritization. 
Do I call account A versus B today, not tomorrow? So long and the short, you've got this broken model where you have very expensive resources doing mundane rote mechanical things. And at the same time, that's your seller, but then there's the market that's changing. Your CRM is depleting at 3% a month. Every month, hundreds, if you if say you had a thousand customers and a thousand prospects, you have customers every day, hundreds of them changing jobs, people going from company A to B, people getting promoted and people leaving. Long and the short, if you ask an individual seller to even monitor their own territory, whether that's a geography or vertical, they're not doing it, let alone at scale. And then that's what's called a pull notification. That means the seller needs to take a moment out of their day, go into LinkedIn, take that information and absorb it, which you know they're not doing. A push notification is where you put it in the place that helps you make decisions, which is your CRM. And you can have a dashboard that tells you which accounts of ours have the most and highest concentration of past customers, which accounts of ours had the biggest changes last month. And so you have all this intelligence in front of you. Uh, and so it's kind of crazy that you'd ask your sellers to be researchers. And that's the problem we're solving. So your website, pipelinesignals.com, when you go visit the website, and please do, right there, big bold letters, you pay your sellers to sell, not to research. That sums it up. You know, it's like, you know, get, get them to where they're really driving value, which is the results. We want the result of that engagement. But to, you know, it is a heavy lift to go in and do all that research. And you can't have your best sellers out there doing that stuff. You just can't. It won't work. It won't scale. No, and it's not only unscalable, uh, you'll feel like you're missing a ton of opportunities and threats. Right. But then, you know, the part that we've, you know, we're so new, we haven't got into the secondary effects. You have high paid resources who are frustrated by the fact that they're doing these rote mechanical tasks. And at what point does that start to affect churn? I mean, it's kind of like a death by a thousand cuts. I mean, it, this isn't the only reason they leave their role, but when you're asking them to be minors, you can't, like, these are the things that add up. Yeah. And, and it's incredibly hard to hire people these days, incredibly hard. And so you have to do everything you can to protect and keep the people you have today and support them the best possible way, not give them reasons to walk out the door. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So was it tough making that leap to say, hey, we're doing this, we're pulling the trigger? Um, you know, I've been a multi-time founder now um, so I'll tell you about the good and the bad. So the good is I have extreme what's called founder market fit. So I've been around and circulating around the problem most of my career. Also, investors see that I have enormous founder market fit. So we could raise capital and we raise capital in under two months. Uh, because, of course, this guy and my business partner, Amar, they know the problem inside and out. So those are some of the good things. Uh, and the last good thing is because Sales for Life was so successful, we had built up retained earnings, we had saved money, that afforded us the ability to start a new business. You can't start you know, sucking a giant salary out of your new business. So it's given us the ability to do that. The tough part, you know, we're, by the end of the year, we'll approach a million, we'll do a million dollars in our first year. And the tough part is I have forgotten what it's like to be the chief bottle washer uh, from day one. And I said this to Amar, my business partner, a couple of days ago. I said, I, for, I have forgotten like the littlest details. We have to write the web copy and the email copy. And I have to order things and my own flights. And I, everything is done by us. Now, of course, you know, there's ways of solving that. And we'll buy back our time over, over time. Yeah. But uh, the inertia of getting a business from zero to yeah. 1 million, I had forgotten what it's like to, to push the rock. Oh yeah. 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 It's hard. It's really hard. And, and, uh, um, I could talk all day long about that. Um, I'm, I'm a big proponent of a group called the entrepreneurs organization. I've, I've been a member. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and, uh, I'm actually chair of the accelerator program here in Denver and Colorado, where we're trying to take entrepreneurs 
above that million dollar mark. And it is, it is people, you know, if you're not an entrepreneur, you don't, it's hard to understand. It's like trying to tell men that having a baby hurts. <laughs> okay, yeah, okay, I bet it hurts. Yeah, exactly. Until you feel that pain, you have no idea how much it yeah. hurts. <laughs> Zero to one is harder than one to three. Oh yeah. But in they have now one to three has very different problems because now you're in process yeah. land. So I'm in I'm in that part of entrepreneurship where you've got founder uh, founder led growth it means the founder yeah. is the one that creates lead flow, yeah. closes deals, runs customer success. Yeah. From one to three, you slowly begin the transition where you build out a demand gen center. Yep. And lead flow comes in and you're probably hybriding a little bit of the founder becomes sales engineer yep. to your sellers, but um, you need then great hires, great process. So it's just a different type of problem, yep. but it's definitely less taxing on the founder of chief bottle washing. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, without a doubt. So if I'm a sales leader and I know, hey, I've got this A team of sellers but I know I've got this problem. Like I, I can't have them in there spending this time to research. How do I tackle that problem? You know, how do I go about bringing in a tool like pipe, pipeline signals and making sure I'm doing it the right way and, and really getting the most value out of that? Yeah, and two ways to think. First is the use cases. So I'd recommend you think of it from two lenses. Lens number one is going to be on your net new BDR, SDR business development team. And what we'll be looking for are people leaving your happy customer base and joining prospective accounts? Those could be named accounts or what we'll call white spacing. So it's a company that meets your ideal customer profile, but you yet have placed it in your CRM as a key account because you almost didn't even know the account existed. Mm -hmm. Or customers use us to tackle new markets, whether that's a vertical or a geographic area. So that's kind of use case one. And of course, the secondary type of signals will identify in that market are going to be net new job changes. As an example, you sell to the CISO or the chief marketing officer. We'll tell you every chief marketing officer that just started a job last week in America, um, in a company that meets your vertical and size requirements. So that's kind of your net new team. Then you have your customer success team. Your customer success team owns existing customers. And if you are, uh, if you are really interested in knowing what churn is like, then you just watch the ill effects of what CSMs can do to your business. If they're not monitoring everybody that walks out the door from your customer base or joins it, because when somebody joins that company, they come with preconceived notions. Yeah. And that means they can have an experience, past experience with your customer base, good for you, or past experience with your competitor, bad for you. We call those like asymmetric competitive advantages. Mm -hmm. So your customer success team needs their own playbook to watching people going in, up and out of every account. And within that, I'll tell a bit of a horror story to kind of plant a seed to your listeners. Uh, we've only had one customer churn uh, in the history of that we've had this. It's pretty simple to buy and simple to keep uh, pipeline signals. But this one customer, we began a journey of monitoring C-level executives only. It had to be a chief data officer, chief information officer, leaving their customer base and going into net new accounts. So in the first two months, we found 90 of these signals. And I thought this was going to be the home run of home runs. You've got a chief information officer that just went into this account. Oh my God, the ultimate decision maker is now in a new account, slam dunk. They came back to us a couple months uh, into our engagement and they said, we got a real problem. It's not with you. It's with what we've discovered in our customer success team. Of the 90 signals that you've sent us, 85 of the 90 signals, our customer success team didn't have that chief information officer in our CRM, didn't know they existed, weren't connected to them on LinkedIn. So thus, when that CIO left our customer and went to a prospect. They didn't even know they needed to backfill a role. And when they got there, we handed the lead to the BDR team. BDR team thought they were getting the Glen Gary, Glen Ross of leads, the pink lead, pink sheet leads. Yeah. 
They picked up the phone thinking they were getting the warmest lead possible. And it was, who are you? Never heard of your company. Right. And all of a sudden, they went from what they thought were going to be super warm to super cold leads. And I tell this story because I use it as a warning sign for customers that the what your customer success team or your account management team does today creates a massive tailwind or headwind for you one year in the future as the people you work with today will change jobs and go into other businesses. They'll either be cold or warm for you, depending on how you treat them. Well, especially if you're targeting certain roles that have a high level of churn, you know, like a CIO or a CMO. Chief a of churn. Officer, six week, six months, six quarters. Yeah. Chief human resources officer, 16 months. Chief marketing officer, under two years. So you're, the people that are in your CRM, the customer success thinks are their champions, influencers, decision makers today, they won't be in that account next year. Yeah. Oh, it's a, yeah. It, I'm sitting there listening to him like 100%. Like if you're not, if you're not leveraging those and, and building those relationships with your existing customer base now, you're doing that for where they're going into the next job they're going to in a year or two yeah. years. And That's why you're putting that and effort. And if you've been doing this long enough, so Saturday Night Live has a skit on this. They call it the five timers. And the five timers are like the Tom Hanks of the world, who <laughs> he is the host five times. Right. Long of the short, at Sales for Life, I was fortunate enough to now do it for 10 years, where we had multiple three and four timers. And at Sales for Life, or at Pipeline Signals, we already have our first two timer. Yeah. Like, so I've, I haven't even had this company for one year yeah. and one chief revenue officer has bought from us twice. Yeah. So this is, the, this is how deals get done. And, you know, sometimes I, I'm still in evangel uh, evangelizing world. So I'm right. you know, preaching from the heavens and, uh, and sometimes you think everybody would get it, but they don't. Yeah. And over time, uh, more and more, more and more chief revenue officers and chief marketing officers are understanding our best deals come from our past customers. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause they, you've got the relationships. Hopefully they're taking with you, taking you with them wherever they're going. And it's like that, um, all that effort you're, you're just, you're recapitalizing all that effort you put in to capture them the first time. Absolutely. Yeah. What's the biggest struggle with implementing a platform like yours? If I'm bringing it in fresh, what's the hardest thing for, for, for companies to to get over to really begin driving that value it's been a big learning lesson that so prospecting is a left and a right brain motion the left side of the brain collects facts data and intelligence to make informed decisions so very quickly we did all of that we monitored accounts mined it for intelligence put it in data uploaders to go in your crm and they show up as task notifications with new contacts, email address, phone number, LinkedIn address in an account. So we covered the left hand, left side of the brain really fast. I didn't anticipate, you know, coming from the sales enablement world for 10 years, how much of the right side of the brain will now need to concentrate on. It has amazed me how few companies have great uh, account based prospecting account-based sales development programs. And those that do have bought all the tools around the sun. They, they bought the sales loft and the outreach IO, but their messaging is awful. And so the engagement of what, now that I have this intelligence and I'm about to call my past customer, it has been amazing to watch how some sellers will spoil that opportunity. They'll take really crappy emails, vanilla emails, press send on their sales loft, out the door over to the customer. I'm like, hold on a second. That was a past customer of seven years no. at you know, a top 100 account. Wait, like, what are you doing? Make a video, make it personal. Yeah. Do something that shows I loved you there. I love you here. Uh, that part is missing from the equation. And there's been a lot of pressure put on sellers to do things faster. Uh, but uh, maybe this future economic nuclear winter that's coming may get people to slow down to speed up. Better messaging, uh, personalized messaging 
that is going to your past customer. That is the one thing that mystifies me that um, I, I collect bad emails. Um, so does my it, business partner. Yeah. He's uh, got a treasure trove. Oh yeah. It, it amazes me that it's like, you didn't spend five seconds. You didn't spend three seconds trying to figure out who I am or what I no, do. No, you, you literally clicked. Yeah. yeah. Just... I got the same email that 5,000, 10,000, 100,000 people got. It, why would I engage with you? You know, and, and the thing that mystifies, mystifies me even more that it's like, if, like you're saying, if you got a customer from seven years where you should have just a, that's where, hey, I'm going to take the time to really compose a very personal email or a video or whatever it is to just say, you know, you're my sweet spot. I'm going to spend all my time on you. Yeah. The hell with everyone else. I'm and, focused on you. Yeah. So that part, now our category is new, right? The buying intent category uh, of sales intelligence has been around forever. Yep. Heavily capitalized, billions of dollars have flown into six cents, Bombora demand base. So that's a category we're forging this new category called relationship signals and they're it's new so people are not giving it the type of account-based love that i think that they should yeah people don't understand account-based selling i'm convinced that no. just based on in our role you know deploying crm um they, they they struggle it's a pain point they don't know how to to do account-based selling do you no, agree with that or do you see that? Oh, no, 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 to uh, 10x on that. Uh, yeah. They know how to nurture a particular stakeholder in an account, right. but not really um, socially surround the buying committee right. and, and work in conjunction with marketing to say, okay, there are 10 people in this account that are really important to us, all part of the buying committee. Yep. And, they'll, and it's the, called the spinning plate theory from the challenger customer. And we're going to use an arsenal of communication to get um, their attention. And that's where marketing is, could be using paid media and retargeting yep. and, you know, inviting them to be a guest on a podcast. That, that could be a marketing play. And the sellers could be using a Sendoso, sending a care package, uh, LinkedIn messages, Twitter yep videos because every one of those buyers will learn differently and okay. I, I i get asked this all the time from sellers like what is what works best an email or a linkedin message right like every person is so different you have no idea before you engage okay. i as an example am an audible's listener even to this own podcast i won't um or sorry not to this podcast think of it as a book there isn't a book i have read in three years but I listen, you name a sales book, I've listened to it and it's on audibles yep. because that's just the way I'll consume it. Right. And so if you were to mail me your book, it is a coaster for my children, right? So <laughs> <laughs> it is just, that's just how I'm going, but you wouldn't have known that up front. No. And so you've got to use all the mediums of communication to help. That's the one thing, the message that I try to get across when I'm working with our clients, that if there is no silver bullet. There's no one thing that works. You have to, like you said, you have to surround them. You have to come at them across channels a variety of different ways because you have no idea what channel they're engaging you on. So if you're just picking one channel, good luck. You know, it, I hope that's the channel they're using. Yeah. Um, you know, just, it, and that seems to be a struggle. Like people, very experienced sellers that I've worked with that really, really struggle with that. Why, why do you think there's such this the metal well, block, and it, it seems? And so if you, and I guess it depends on your market. So look at, uh, look at my business, right? So when you're zero to $10 million and you have a large TAM, you're a, a fort like me, me. I'm in a blue ocean, both 10 years in sales for life. I was the first social selling training company for years before even the next competitor came around. And of the 600 customers we won, and let's say we, uh, we had a, a win rate of 20, 25%. So maybe I did 3000 demos or so over 10 years, we encountered a competitor, like in my memory, like a dozen times. So I swam in a blue ocean. And when you're a sub $10 million business, um, 
you're primarily your TAM is so massive that you can afford to do a couple touches, do a demo. You know what? Like if you're not interested, I have an ocean here. Right. And I would say that something that's important as a large organization bringing in those for enablement and training, many times those that are enabling you are living in a world where they're in such a blue ocean. They think the strategies that are working for their business automatically work for you, but you're a seller at Microsoft who sells into a ge geographic node that's like the size of six blocks. And so now the important piece is if you work at a truly global enterprise or global mid-market company, your world is so finite. You may only have five, 10, up to up to 50 accounts. So you have to be so selective. You have to be so pointed. And I think that most sellers um, are either taking advice from those that swim in a blue ocean or they've come from a playbook that has swam in a blue ocean and they don't realize how finite their world really is right. and how pointed they need to be. Right. Uh, I, yeah, I, I agree with that completely. Uh, one of the things you said earlier that I want to look back on is, because uh, I've experienced this, is uh, it's great when people leave and they go somewhere else and they can take you there. It's fantastic. But you have to protect your turf with the people coming in. And because I've had that happen where new people come in, they, you know, the old guy loved me, the new guy has no clue who I am or the value oh. or the history. They don't know anything. I'm starting at zero. And if you don't have a plan to address that, it's just a matter of time before they bring in whoever they loved at their last company. I, I call them poison pills. And so uh, somebody's going to go into that business. I'll tell a story. So forever and ever, um, I have only used one CRM from the year 2007 until about the year 2018, I had only ever used Salesforce. And I vowed, I would never even entertain the idea of looking at another CRM. We hire a CMO and that CMO came from an agency that only had ever used HubSpot. And part of the deal was you want that talent, you comes with him, the people process technology that made him successful. Within three months, we didn't have Salesforce anymore, we had HubSpot. Now, you know, we're a small business, so the Salesforce rep probably wasn't watching nor cared, but that could have been an early leading indicator. Human capital migration is the ultimate leading indicator to where their priority is going to go into a business, up in a business or out. And you can see sometimes the writing on the wall yeah. when these things happen. Oh, yeah. It's, it amazes me that how many times like people will call me and they're like, Hey, uh, we want to talk CRM. And I'm like, great. Why? What's the why? Oh, we just hired someone new and they love such and such. Um, so I was told to give you guys a call. Yeah. And I'm like, that's why you want, yes. you know, <laughs> change, change is a foot when yeah. I'll tell you another statistic that we're learning about. So in the first 100 days on the job, a new executive, so they'll come in the door and about week one or two, they're still trying to figure out where the washrooms are. But afterwards, by day 100, they will either physically have deployed or mentally know where they're going to place up to 70% of the remitted budget for the whole year. Because they've, they've been given a mandate. Within a quarter, you need to start making an impact. Yeah. And so you have that time period to plant some seeds but as well, expect change will happen within that timeline. Oh, yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt. And it's like, if you're the odd man out, if you're not building those relationships and coming in and demonstrating, here's our value. Here's, let me tell you, that everything we've done to transform this business or help them and be their partner, whatever that is, if you're not delivering that message, their the partner from their old company is. 100%. Yeah. Um, what are some of the key benefits we talk, you know, are there any other benefits we haven't talked about about leveraging a tool like pipeline signals? I guess that the one that we didn't dive into as much was the the competitive intelligence. So there's essentially three major plays 
One is centered around your customer. One is centered around net new jobs. And uh, the third is centered around competitive intelligence. So this is where you're able to monitor people who have left past, in, ex, past work experience and or past employment with your competitors and where they're going. Because, and there's a bit of a risk barometer. There are times where if, if somebody leaves past employment of your competitor and goes into an account and they can be part of that buying committee, they will be the ultimate uh, poison pill. And so again, that serves that customer success team or your account management team so in such a vital way so that they can know that this is about to potentially happen. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, I never thought about the competitor side of things, but that that's really intriguing because yeah, like if if you've got a competitor going into one of your customers, you... they'll inevitably yeah. shake some trees. I'll, I'll tell a story around this. So in my Sales for Life days, we ran um, a team-based workshop. It was an account-based sales development workshop where they would put tables of, you know, eight to 10 SDR, BDR, AE, sales engineers, what have you, all in a table. And this was a giant cybersecurity customer. And so all these tables, and what we would do is assign one account uh, to each different table. And somebody at that table actually owned that account. They would flip over the card and they had an hour to do sales intelligence and key account planning to prepare an action strategy for that account. And the concept was, you know, eight heads are better than one. Right. Come up with a strong plan. And I'll always remember this. It was about a half an hour into the session. And I see a lady over in the corner crying. I've, I've been to a lot of sales kickoffs and I hadn't seen tears. And I walked over and I said, what's going on? And she said, you can't believe that for the last eight months, I've been working the Harley Davidson account and based on what you taught us and mining intelligence and looking for the sales intelligence that it only took me five minutes to realize that one of the key executives at Harley, in fact, used to work at our competitor. And now I realize that I, we were been throwing in proposals and they've been hitting a brick wall because by the time they hit that chief operating officer's oh, desk, man. the person's like, why are we looking at them? Like, why don't we call Bob my buddy over yeah. the past company? And eight months. So her year was toast. Yeah. She spent all this time working this deal that with five minutes of searching, she would have realized it was right in front of her face. She should have deselected or deprioritized this account. Yeah. Oh, no, that's brutal. That's a brutal feeling because you keep thinking like, oh, this, if I just put in a little bit more effort, I'm going to get over that hump. I'm going to get over that blocker you don't have a chance yeah you didn't have a chance from the beginning yeah so thus why spend the calories right that's amazing jamie i love listening to you this has been a great episode um really appreciate you coming on sales lead doug people want to reach out they want to connect with you if they want to learn more about pipeline signals what's the best way for them to do that um they can connect with me on linkedin uh, go to pipelinesignals.com happy to help them show them how we do what we do and potentially help them uh, I'm here as a sales resource. I'm not going anywhere. That's awesome. All that stuff will be on our show notes. Um, if you didn't catch that, be sure to check us out on impellercrm.com forward slash sales lead dog, where you can find this episode, um, get those show notes. Jamie, thanks again for coming on sales lead dog and welcome to the pack. Thank you so much. As we end this discussion on Sales Lead Dog, be sure to subscribe to catch all our episodes. On social media, follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Watch the videos on YouTube. And you can also find our episodes on our website at impellercrm.com forward slash Sales Lead Dog. Sales Lead Dog is supported by Impeller CRM, delivering objectively better CRM for business, guaranteed.